So, what does it really mean to study? Well, it's the application of the mind to the acquisition of knowledge through reading, investigation, or reflection. Now, these are the key points. Reading, investigation, and reflection. Reading involves reading your book or reading your notes. Investigation means asking questions, whether that's in lecture or in, in office hours or labs. You ask questions. That's investigation. Speaking of labs, investigation would also involve actual practical work where you get to apply some of what you're learning in lecture. And lastly, there's reflection. Reflection just basically means thinking about what you've learned. Reflection basically means that you ask yourself some questions about things like, does this make sense? Or how is this relevant? Or how does this apply to this particular situation? Okay, all of these things are components of studying. But before you start studying, you first must decide to study. And that's really the main or most difficult part of studying, I suppose, is keeping yourself motivated to study. Now, some students are very naturally good at motivating themselves, but most are not. Similarly, professors are very good, at least some of them can be very good at motivating their students to study, but again, many are not. They might be very good at motivating themselves and finding their own material very interesting, but they might struggle with making the material seem interesting to others. So, in the end, it's really going to be up to you to try to motivate yourself. Next, you need to make sure that you set some rules for studying. Okay, so this is very important because you want to keep the distractions to a minimum. Um, recent studies have shown that many undergraduates show signs of stress when they're unable to use their phone for more than 10 minutes. Um, now, this is kind of a scary thing um, because that just basically means that every 10 minutes you feel the need to check your phone whether it has gone off or not. Similarly, there's some studies that have shown that just the presence of a phone nearby keeps you distracted. So some people have a hard time focusing when their phone is nearby. It doesn't even have to be their phone. So keep that in mind when you set up some rules for yourself. So I would recommend that maybe you turn off or put your mobile phone on silent. And also keep it outside the room, somewhere out of sight, so that you're not tempted to keep checking it and you don't see it. Uh, secondly, you may need to help uh, to enlist the help of your friends and family. You may need to ask them to simply avoid calling you with or messaging you at certain times. Tell your family to avoid distracting you or calling on you at certain times of the day. This way you know that this time has been set aside for me for studying and I won't be getting anyone trying to get in touch with me at this point, so I can focus on my work. And so you need to try to make a routine. You want to set a specific time and a specific place. We'll talk a little bit about scheduling later on. Um, but you want to set a few things up for yourself and try to make it a habit. Just do it. No excuses. Every day or every week that you specifically set aside for this, make sure you do it. Try not to change anything in your schedule once you've set it. Now, I can't help you too much with what I just talked about, but what I will try to do is I will try to give you some specific advice on the following three things. So we'll talk a little bit about preparing for lectures. This is something that you will have to do before class. I'll talk a little bit about taking notes. This is something that you'll be doing before and during class. And we'll talk a little bit about reviewing your notes, something that you do after class. And so this will require a bit of scheduling and planning. So when you take all of these three components together, this is what we're talking about when we talk about studying. These three things are the keys to your success. So, let's start by talking about preparing for lectures. First of all, it's important to understand that you are not a sponge. So, you cannot just passively absorb knowledge. You can't just show up to lecture and expect things to just enter your mind without any effort on your part. To put it another way, um, for the biology geeks out there, knowledge transfer will not happen through osmosis. So you need to prepare. Now, 
preparing means that before lecture, you find out which topic is going to be covered. Now, hopefully, you won't be doing five minutes before lecture, but actually sometime before the lecture. Find out which topic is being covered. Find out which chapters or which chapter sections you need to read through and go through them. Okay, now how do I find out all this information? Well, you look in your syllabus. The syllabus in most courses will list the topics and will also specifically list which chapters will be covered in each particular lecture. So if you keep track of that stuff, you'll be able to figure out exactly which parts to read or prepare before the lecture. But try to make sure that this doesn't happen. From the book, through the head, and gone forever. So, yes, you will need to look at your book before the lecture, but you don't need to read through the whole thing. You don't really need to memorize anything. You just want to familiarize yourself with the content of the chapter or the section that you're supposed to be preparing for. So, you want to skim the chapter to get an overview. Again, you're not trying to read the whole thing all the way through. You don't want to struggle with it for several hours. You just want to take half an hour to an hour to flip through the pages and get an overall idea of what's going on. So you'll be looking at things like section headings. You'll be looking at learning objectives. Anything that's in bold might be important for you to know because the prof will probably be using it and they will assume that you've read through that part. Um, and then just look at the first sentence in each paragraph. That should give you an overview of what's going on. Examine the figures and tables. Those are very useful. They are quite often used to summarize a lot of text in one simple figure. And lastly, you'll be looking at the chapter summaries to see if there's anything else that you need to look at. Once you've done all this, try to rephrase the ideas that you have just looked at. So try to put them into your own words. If you can actually take what you have read through and put it into your own words, it means that you understand fairly well. This exercise will also help to encode the information for you, uh, but also will give you an idea of which parts you understand relatively well and which parts you're struggling with, so which parts you really need to pay attention to in lecture, and maybe which questions you might want to ask. So let's take a look at a chapter from your textbook. So I've selected a chapter dealing with viruses and bacteria. Uh, it's unlikely that you have gotten anywhere near this chapter yet in Bio 101, so that's one of the reasons I chose it. Um, and so when we're looking at this thing, one of the first things to note on just the cover of this chapter is that we have an outline. And that outline gives us four main topics that this chapter will cover. And so Knowing this will help you to organize your notes later on during lecture, because chances are your professor will also be looking at this outline and trying to organize their lecture in a very similar way. And so they might not go through all the different topics, but they might do two or three of the four. And so it's important for you to know that these are the main ideas, the main topics. This way, when the professor is talking about them, you have an idea of where he or she is going and what sort of things they will be likely to be talking about. If we look on the next page, in the very first section, we have at the very beginning a listing of the learning outcomes. So in here, this tells you exactly what the authors of this section would be likely to get out of this section. Okay? So again, you'll see that they're looking for major things. They're not looking at very big details here. So they want you to learn things like uh, how do viruses differ with regard to their host range structure and genomes? Okay, so that's a fairly overall, fairly large topic. Um, they want you to be able to list six steps in the viral productive cycle. Okay, so you know that you should have six steps of something that you're going to be learning about, and so on. So you look at these things, and then you read through that chapter, or at least skim through that chapter, so with those things in mind. Also notice all the things that are listed in bold. Again, because your profs assume that you are going to be preparing for lectures, they will not necessarily try to highlight all these things or define all these terms for you during lecture. They will assume that you know what those terms mean. So it's an important thing to be able to do is just to go through and write those out for yourself. So you have your definitions written out so you know exactly what these terms mean. So as you're reading this chapter, you will learn that a virus is a small infectious particle that consists of nucleic acid and closed net protein coat. 
Okay, so again, your prof may not define that for you in lecture, so this is something that you will need to know. Um, your prof may also not define what a host cell is, so it might be important to know that a cell that has been infected by a virus is called a host cell. Again, if you don't know this ahead of time, and your prof starts talking about host cells and viruses, you might struggle to try to keep up. Let's take a look at this page here. Now, uh, I didn't take a picture of the whole page, but basically the whole page looks kind of like this. It's a lot of text. Now, when you look at this, you might think, oh, this is going to take forever to read through. But it doesn't have to. Again, what we're looking for in this case here, we're just skimming through the chapter. So we just want to look at the first sentence of each paragraph. So if you look at the paragraphs that are available to us, let's take a look at this. It says, step one, attachment. Okay, so we're looking at something that has steps. And recall that we had a learning objective that had something to do with steps. So this is probably one of those things. So step one, attachment. The first step of a viral reproductive cycle, the virus must attach to the surface of a host cell. One sentence. And that tells you that, okay, if a virus is going to infect a cell, it has to first attach. Okay, that's step one. That seems pretty simple. Step two is entry. After attachment, the viral genome enters the host cell. Okay, so that tells us that after attachment, the virus has to inject its genome into the cell. We're missing step three in this picture, so we're going to skip over that. Step four, synthesis of viral components. What does that mean? The production of new viruses by a host cell involves the replication of the viral genome and the synthesis of viral proteins that make up the protein coat. So basically, you have components of a virus being synthesized by the host. And then step five, viral assembly. After all the necessary components have been synthesized, they must be assembled into new viruses. We're looking at new viruses being produced inside the cell from the components that were just synthesized in the previous step. We basically spent maybe two minutes, maybe five minutes, looking at just the first sentence on one page, and we get a fairly decent overview of what's going on. So, you might ask, really? Is this okay? And yeah, yeah it is. Again, we're just skimming, we're not trying to read. At some point you probably will want to read the textbook, and at that point having that initial overview will really help. Okay, but initially when you're just preparing for the lecture, skimming is perfectly fine. So yes, it is allowed. Why does it work? Well, it works because of just how paragraphs are structured in general. In general, the structure of a paragraph is very similar to the structure of your favorites cheeseburger. You have a bun on top and bottom, and then there's stuff in between. The stuff in between is the meaty stuff, the, the stuff that might be interesting to you, but the bun is really the main idea. You have something on top that's easy to grasp, and that's basically a paragraph. The stuff on top, the top of the bun, is the main idea. The first sentence, maybe two. The stuff underneath is the supporting material, the stuff that basically gives the reasoning why the above sentence is true. And then the bottom bun is basically just a summary of what was just stated, some sort of a closing sentence. So why does it work? Because really the main idea of that paragraph is stated right there at the very beginning. The rest of it is really just the support, the evidence for that statement. And also don't forget, your textbook is full of figures. And figures can be used to summarize things very neatly, uh, and a lot of material can be summarized in a very small space within a figure. So in this case, you're looking at a figure that summarizes the steps of infection by a virus. And the neat thing is that we just read about attachment, we read about the entry, we read about synthesis of viral components in step four and step five, viral assembly, and all these things are listed in this figure with a short summary of what it is. The other neat thing about this is that it shows you actually two different types of viruses. We have the lambda phage and we have the HIV virus, both being represented in this figure, and both of them showing you that they both basically have the same basic principles. The same basic steps are followed by both. Now clearly there are some differences, there are some uh, ways in which they differ from one another, but overall the steps are the same. Both of them have attachment, both of them have entry, both of them deal with integration, synthesis of viral components, viral assembly, and release. So this figure very neatly summarizes a lot of information that would have maybe taken two pages of reading for you to understand, 
or you can just take a look at this figure, read through the stuff in there, and understand the same basic idea. Similarly, we haven't read about the lytic and lysogenic cycle, and chances are, as a Bio 101 student, you probably haven't covered this stuff yet. But you could probably take a look at this figure on your own right now and just follow the arrows, read the statements that are there with the different numbers, and you could probably figure out the differences between these two cycles. You could figure out what they are, what they do, and how they are different from one another. So just by looking at a figure, you can get a lot of information. And that's one of the points of the figures in the textbook. It's to summarize a lot of text into something that's a little bit more easy to visualize. Lastly, chapter summaries. So at the end of each chapter, you will have some sort of a summary. Uh, and in this case here, it's very neat because if you look at this, and you look at the initial learning outcomes, you will see that they are fairly well aligned. So with your initial summary, what you have is the first point just gives you a definition of a virus. And then after that, you can see that the learning outcomes are fairly neatly summarized within the chapter summary. Now please note that the learning outcome in the chapter summary um, sentence are very similar in some cases. So if you look at learning outcome number one, compare and contrast how viruses differ with regard to their host range structure and genomes, you will notice that the summary says viruses vary with regard to their host range structure and genome composition. So you're not getting a lot of extra information within that summary, but the summary does point you to some figures and tables that will summarize the relevant information for you. So Keep in mind that you don't want to just read the summaries. The summary by itself it may not be very helpful, but if you skim through the chapter and then use the summary as a review of the concepts, you will probably do quite well in terms of getting a good overview of what's going on. So, why skim? Well, first of all, it gives you the main points. You get the big picture. Um, you get an idea of the overall uh, concepts and the details you don't have to worry about so much yet because the lecture is still coming up and the prof will quite often fill in the details for you and also explain some of the concepts. So even if you don't understand everything that's in there, uh, you'll get at least some partial preparation for it and so when the prof starts talking, it won't be all completely new. Secondly, it helps you to understand lecture better. You're already going to be familiar with the terminology. Remember all those things in bold. Again, you've looked at them, you know what they mean, so when the prof says host cell, you know exactly what he means. So, it gives you an idea of what the prof is talking about. It will also give you an idea of what the prof will be talking about next. Chances are the lecture will be, um, will be organized in the same way as the, uh, the textbook itself. Now, also we'll give you an idea of how the ideas are linked and you have seen the figures already the prof will likely be showing you those figures so you want to look at how did i understand this figure and how is the prof explaining it so if you look at those things you'll have a better chance of really understanding what's going on keep in mind if you don't skim first if you don't prepare for your lectures it will all seem important and this is one of the reasons why students quite often struggle with note taking because when they hear the prof talking they try to write everything down. And not everything may be that terribly crucial. And so if you know ahead of time what the main concepts are, you'll have a better idea of how to organize your notes or where the prop is going with their lecture uh, from one point to another. 